There we go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, and that song was going off in me all throughout all of this so far this morning. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. And then Pastor God finished with it. The name of Jesus. You must go through the name of Jesus, sister. You sang about it. Uh, fear not. How can all of this went together? And I just knew, Pastor, you were going to break out in your song. Jesus, lover of my soul. Yes. Jesus, I will never let you go. Take me from the miry clay. Set my feet up on the rock. And now I know, yes, I love you and I need you. Yes, though my world may fall, I will never let you go. My Savior and my closest friend. Yes, and I will worship you until the very end. Yeah, praise God. Well, this is interesting because I think this message is going right along with what, what's happening here. Uh, and, and it picks up where I left you last time. But I want to tell you a little bit about sanctification. We talked about consecration last I was here. But then that goes into sanctification. Sanctification is God's part. God makes us holy. Amen. And makes us useful to Him. Amen. We consecrate ourselves. We dedicate ourselves to Him. And in that dedication, God is able to sanctify us and make us holy. That's why He says, be holy as I am holy. That's why we can. Yes. Because the responsibility of you and me is to dedicate ourselves to Him. And He will sanctify us and make us holy. Amen. I was watching a uh, documentary uh, on Pure Flix about the Azusa Street Revival. And the thing that started this Azusa Street Revival, there were three topics of preaching that went on there. It was salvation, sanctification, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was what got this going. Maria Woodworth Edder said, come out from the Laodicean church and become a, a Philadelphian. Ooh, yes. Come out of the Laodicean church and become a Philadelphian. And I believe that is the word of God to us today. That is what the Spirit of God is saying to His people today. Is to come out of that Laodicean church and join the church of the Philadelphians. Smith Wigglesworth preached a message in October of 1914 in Oakland, California on a Monday night. The title of that message was What Will You Have Me To Do? The text that he used was Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. When Saul fell to the ground and the risen Lord had appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you working against me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And what was his response? Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Yeah. That was consecration. All right. In this encounter, Smith Wigglesworth said in his message that this is the place of yieldness, of yieldedness where God wants us to be. He said that the people there that were in that meeting here in his sermon that October of 1914 in Oakland, California, imagine that. In California, these things are happening. Look where Mario Morello is at working today. Smith Wigglesworth said to that congregation there that were hearing him preach this message, he said to them, he said, you're here seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're here seeking salvation, some of you, and sanctification. And he said to them, oh, and healing, and then you're here to receive healing. But Smith said to them, he said, I see nothing, absolutely nothing in the way except unyieldedness to the plan of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me say it one more time. 
Smith Wigglesworth, October 1914, said to that congregation, he said, you're here for salvation. You're here for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're here for healing. He said, I see absolutely nothing in your way except unyieldedness to the plan of God. Wow. Good stuff. Kenneth Hagin said this. He said, I was a Baptist boy when I received salvation. He said, I was a Baptist boy when I received healing. He said, that same spirit as a Baptist boy that taught me about salvation taught me about healing. And that same spirit led me to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank you. The same spirit. I believe that God's calling His church in this late hour to consecrate ourselves. All right. yes, to make ourselves yielded to His plan in this day. So that He may do a great work in the world today. People desperately do not need to see you and me. But they need to see the Holy Ghost through you and me. Yes. Amen. That's what they need to see. It's time for us all to yield ourselves to the plan of God. I had a word drop in my spirit several, well, a couple years ago, maybe two years ago. And I think I told y'all about this before, I don't know, but I'll, I'll tell you for those who hadn't heard. I went to lay down one night, and this very strange word came up on the inside of me that I had not heard before, I didn't know what it meant. And that word was chupacabra. And I thought, okay, that sounds Hispanic. I thought maybe it's a city. In, you know, a city in Mexico or something. So, um, you know, I said, I'm laying down, so I nudged Pastor and I said, I said, what is a chupa, or what is chupacabra? And he said, I think it's a Mexican demon. I was like, that's weird. So I went on and laid down. The next morning when I got up, I still remembered that. And so I started talking to the Lord about it and I started looking this up and seeing what a chupacabra is. It is a Mexican demon. They believe it's a literal, a literal living Mexican, uh, I mean, a, a, a demon that the Hispanic population believes is uh, a spirit that sucked the life out of their livestock. It sucked the goat, uh, the blood out of the goats. So when you look up the definition of chupacabra, it says goat sucker. And I said, God, what? why is that coming up to me? And he said, because this spirit is unleashed in this last day and hour on the church. The ones that are hanging on both sides, the world and on the church side. And he said that this spirit has come to suck what remaining life out of them that they have. It's a day of a separation of the sheep and the goats. It's time to come out from among them and be separate. It's time for the church to come out of Laodicea and come in to Philadelphia. All right. Amen. It's time. Folks are saying, well, I don't see a great revival coming, but rather the Bible tells us it's a day of a great apostasy. True. The Bible does say there will be a great falling away. Not, it doesn't talk about this great revival, but it talks about a great falling away and apostasy. Right? But I believe there's both. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because Jesus hasn't yet returned. And if there was no need for a great revival, Jesus would have come. Because the Bible says that His not coming means that there's still fruit to be harvested. There's still a harvest. And so if there is still a harvest, then there's still a work to be done. But the Bible says that believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The Bible says that they will speak with new tongues. The Bible says that they will cast out devils. Yes. The Bible talks about all these signs and wonders will follow them who believe the Lord working with them as they go. Yes. So yes, there's a great falling away, but there's also a revival happening. Yes. It's a separation of the sheep and the goats. Yes, it is. But it's time. For anything that has held us back in complacency or being stagnant, it's time for, as Hebrews 12, 1 said, throw those things off. Lay them aside. It's time for us to run the race with endurance. 
I believe we are in that hour that God is calling a church to sanctification. You're worried about our country, especially after what we saw just happened? Me too. I don't know if you saw in the news, but 87,000 IRS agents have been added to the payroll of the federal government. What are they gearing up for? Let's stop well, if you remember, Obama did the same thing. He built the IRS up. And that's when we had them investigating nonprofits, which were Christian nonprofits, and they were going after them. That's what they're trying to do again. But C.S. Lewis said this. He said, in history, you're going to find that Christians who did most for this present world were precisely the ones who thought most of the next. Did you get that? Those who did the most for this world were the ones whose minds were on the next. Ooh, yes. I believe that. The world's getting darker, yes. but the church is getting brighter. Yes. I believe that. I want to take you to the text here in John 17. John chapter 17. There's three verses I really want to look at right here and really dig into. And that's going to be verses 17, 19, and 20. But we're going to read, for context purposes, read verses 14 to 20. Keep my handy dandy Bible app open here. Because sometimes I like to get the Amplified reading. All right, so in verses 14... 320 in John. Is this uh, is this red letter edition in your Bible? Yes. So who's speaking here? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus is talking to us. He said, I've given them your word. He's praying. And he said, the world hates them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but you would keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am and not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so I send them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Thank God. Thank God. We're going to delve into that right there. There's a lot of interesting things here. First, verse 17. Jesus asked the Father to sanctify His disciples. How? By the Word. By the Word. Verse 19. Jesus says, I sanctify myself. You know what that is? That was a declaration that He is God. Yes. That's what that is. He said, before Abraham was, I am yes. This was another declaration that He is God because He is able to sanctify Himself. See, He asks the Father to sanctify you and me through His Word. Yes. But He says, but I sanctify myself because He can, because He's God. And because God alone is holy, He is able to sanctify Himself, but we need God to sanctify us. In verse 20, Jesus prayed for all those who would become holy disciples through our message today. You and me, through our message to the world today, Jesus prayed that people would become disciples because of you and me, even still today, reaching out to the world. See, in that Romans, um, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that's, that's how we got, you know, that's the scripture basis for salvation prayer, right? That, you know, if you believe with your heart, Jesus, uh, you know, is raised from the dead and you confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. And uh, it goes on from there, though. And it says, how will they believe without a preacher? If there is no revival left, there's no need for us to go out and preach. But because Jesus says, by Him not coming, He's telling you and me there's still a harvest to be reached. Yes. And we must preach so that faith can come and that they can be saved. Now, let's go back to focusing on verse 17. 
He said we were to be sanctified by the word. Sanctification, um, I looked this up at azusastreet.org. You can go there and you can read about William Seymour. He was the minister of that great outpouring at Azusa Street. And it talks about his doctrine and disciplines, the apostolic faith of William Seymour. And it described it, sanctification, as being called the second work of grace. See, the first work of grace was justification. That was God's act of free grace to you and me to receive the remission of sins. As it said in Ephesians 2, 8, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, right? That's justification. That was the first work of grace. But sanctification is the second work of grace. And that is the act of God's grace where he makes us holy in doctrine and life. It's a cleansing to make us holy through the washing of water of the word. Thank you, Jesus. That's Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. It says that Christ gave himself for the church. Why? That he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God. There's a sanctification process that a large number of the church has skipped out on. Yeah. 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 They've never gone on to be holy as He is holy. Yes, Thank you, Jesus. But God's calling out to the church today to rise up and be holy. Right. Dedicate ourselves. Consecrate our, ourselves to His work today. He wants to do a great outpouring in this moment and in this hour. But the church has got to dedicate. The church has got to yield yes. to His plan. Amen. And that is to be washed with the water of the Word. Now, why did he say to do this? In that same chapter of Ephesians in verse 26 and 27, he says that he did that so that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. All right. See, you and I and everybody else in the church wondered how we could be a spotless bride. Haven't we? I haven't. And we've gone back and forth in doctrine from doctrine on that, trying to figure out how it is that we could be a spotless bride. But he said it right there. By the washing of the water of the Word, and it will be no other way. It is the only way, not because you or I were good enough to be spotless, not because our sins are less than our neighbors, but only because we are washed. We have submitted ourselves to God to be washed by the water of the Word. If you've not had a life dedicated to the Word of God being lived out in your life, which means you've got to pick it up, you've got to read it, you've got to study it, you've got to get into it, and you've got to start applying it. Yes. Amen. It means that the church that's on Sunday that just wants to hear a good message and then go out and live the rest of the world's ways of living and be all about this world means that that is not spotless. That is not without blemish. All right. And you're going to find yourself not prepared for the bridegroom. Amen. No. But it should take the pressure off of us. That it's not something impossible or out of our reach to do. But that you and I absolutely can be a part of being the spotless bride without spot or blemish just by yielding ourselves yes. to the Word of God and letting us wash us clean. Yes. Just living it. Just living it. Hallelujah. Just living it. Now you say, I'm doing the best I can. Well is the best you can, including that you do read it, that you apply yourself to understand it. It is the best that you can do that you are putting it to practice in your life. You're hearing it, you're reading it, but what are you doing with it? Then if you're doing those things, yes, I believe you are part of that spotless bride because he is washing away our blemishes. How many Christians go on to this second, second work of grace? Not many. In this passage, Jesus through Paul is telling us about the bride in preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb that I believe is about to occur. 
I believe you and I are going to see it in our day. I believe it's going to be in my day. I do. I used to never think that. Yeah, you know, I thought, well, you know, they've been saying that for a long time, and everybody, you know, every generation. I have come to believe that we are living the day, that we are the generation that will see it. Yes. In this passage, though, Paul is describing the marriage relationship, comparing the natural one to a spiritual one, a marriage. He's talking about marriage in that uh, passage in Ephesians. But I always wondered about this up until now. Who's the bride? Who's the bride? I want to be a part of the bride. But who exactly is the bride? Because something ain't been jiving about that. And I have felt like I need to know. God, I need to know. Am I the bride? Am I missing being the bride? I don't want to not be the bride because I believe you're coming. And I don't want to not be the bride. I believe we can know the difference between the bride and just a sinner saved by grace. Because the one attained the first work of grace but never attained to the second to be washed by the water of the word to remove your spots and blemishes so that you could be holy and blameless. Without the washing of the water of the word, you are not. That's what the scripture says in Ephesians 5. You say, how can that be? Well, you see it in Christians whose beliefs line up with the world's beliefs. They don't seem to have anything renewed here. That's because Romans 12, 1 said, what? Consecrate yourselves, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to the word of God. There's another scripture telling us sanctification. You see, the consecration is to present yourselves. The sanctification is the renewal of your mind. God's making us holy with His Word. Think about the five foolish virgins and the five wise. Did you ever wonder about that? I did. Who are they? They all appear to be the church. Do they not? Because they're all virgins. It describes them as virgins. The oil in their lamps, what is it? Remember Jesus saying, the eye is the lamp of the body. If it be good, the body is full of light. Yes. Ancient teachings say this, the eyes dominate the countenance. In other words, the eyes reveal what's really on the inside. Mm -hmm. Cicero said, for every action derives from the soul, the countenance is the image of the soul. And the eyes are its chief indicators. Interesting. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, you'll find about the, the, the parable about the virgins. What is the definition of a virgin? Because all ten were virgins. A virgin is a maiden who's qualified to be married. She's qualified to be married. The first work of grace qualifies you to be married to Christ. But what makes you the bride is that second work of grace, sanctification. Because to be the bride, you must be holy. Yeah. What about the lamps? The lamps hold the oil. It's the vessel that holds the oil. The reborn spirit has been made fit to receive the oil. And the oil is that consecration to the Lord. When the foolish ones asked, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he said, I don't know you. Do you know what that word know is? To perceive with the eyes. To perceive with the eyes. In other words, he knew what was inside them. Or what was not. Yeah. Foolish means did not take heed. Which is why at the end of that parable, Jesus says, Take heed therefore. I always thought it was about the ones who were looking for him, watching and waiting. But I've learned it's more than that. 
It's about the ones who through all generations have prepared themselves for His coming. Because there's been generations, thank God for them, before you and I, who dedicated themselves to the plan of His service. Who read the Word. Who lived the best they could by that Word. I know my grandmother was one of them. My grandmother, my, my uh, Hattie Baker, my great-grandmother, and Fern Ryder, my grandmother, were awesome examples to me. Pastors, grandmother, ma'am, these women applied the word to their lives. I know they have prepared themselves to be the bride. And one day at that last trump, the last trump will sound. And we know it says that those dead in Christ are going to rise. And those who are alive and remain will come up together with them, meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the bride. The bride. There's many that have gone before you and me that have prepared themselves to be the bride. They've made their gown spotless, without blemish. Not because they were just such holy people within themselves, but because they allowed the washing of the water of the Word and lived their life. Reading the Word and applying the Word to their life. That's the bride of Christ. Gives you a whole new um, meaning to, oh, I want to be in that number. I want to go back to read you. How, how am I doing, Pastor God? Okay, I'm, I'm coming down. I've got a... Um, a reference I want to take you back to and remind you of something that I read here the last time I was, I was speaking to you about being holy as He is holy. I want to remind you something Kenneth Hagin said. He said, there seems to be a lack of deep consecration to do God's will among Christians today. He said that as he was thinking about the difference between his experiences in the full gospel circles 50 years ago and today, he realized that there wasn't nearly as much sickness among spirit-filled Christians 50 years ago as there is today. He continued, I remembered the great manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we used to experience in our meetings. And he said the move of God, the Holy Ghost, was much greater and in more consistent demonstration back then than it is today. As I was thinking about this, he said, the Spirit of God spoke up in my spirit and said, yes. And the consecration of my people was greater too. Remember what Smith Wigglesworth said? I see absolutely, listen, listen to him as if he is speaking to us today. I can, I can picture Smith Wigglesworth being here and saying to us, you want great revival like what we had? I can see Maria Woodworth Edder standing here as you'd often see pictures of her holding her finger up pointing at, at God. You want great manifestations like I've seen in my day, she would say. I see nothing. <laughs> absolutely nothing standing in the way but unyieldedness to the plan of God. Yes. Stuff. It's not being baptized in the Holy Ghost that brought these manifestations about or healings alone. But it was a devotion to live for God yes. with Amen. the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was not just salvation. It was not just the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but it was a sanctification. Sanctification that brought about these manifestations. God honored that depth of consecration and reverence by giving His people great manifestations of the Holy Ghost. Think about that today. We want God to honor us as the reverence for Him and in His house has diminished. Right? People want church to look more relaxing. They want church to look more fun. They want church to look more accommodating, more appealing. It's only revealing a lack of consecration yes. in the lives of the church. And there is a great need for sanctification. 
the sentiments and pleasures of the world. No wonder God forgive the church and stir our hearts, God. Yes, stir our hearts, God, so that we'll return to you, that we might see another great move of the Spirit of God in the midst of the darkest days we've ever seen. I believe that. Concluding with verse 20 over here in John 17. John 17, verse 20, Jesus said, Neither I pray for these alone, but for them also who will believe on me through their word. The only way that we're going to see this great last move of God, this final harvest, is when we start living a life dedicated to the Lord. Amen. Our witness is more than our words. It's our life lived unto God before the eyes of the world around us. Thank you, Jesus. If we're just blending in and acting and doing like them, they don't see us. Nope. We need the power. Hallelujah. In conclusion, will you turn with me uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 3? Y'all don't believe this, that there's not another great revival. Just because we believe there is another great revival doesn't mean that we don't know that there's a great falling away. We do. But it's just because the line's been drawing it more clearly. It's just because it's time to get out of Laodicea and get into Philadelphia. It's just because it's time for the separation of the sheep and the goats. Amen. That's what's going on. Amen. The world is getting darker, but the church is getting brighter. Yes. All right, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to read out of the Amplified Version, but you follow along. Bear with me, because I think there's something great to conclude out of this. But understanding that in the last days, dangerous times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. And they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, calloused and inhumane, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, intemperate and immoral, brutal, haters of good, Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of outward godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such people and keep far from them, for among them are those who worm their way into homes and captivate morally weak and spiritually dwarfed women weighed down by the burden of their sins. Interesting that it says women. The Bible talks about a church as a bride. I believe we're talking about those who continue to ride the fence. Those who will still live a complacent life. Can easily be won over. Remember what the Lord showed me about that spirit of Chupacabra. They're easily swayed by various impulses. Always learning and listening to anybody who will teach them but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, unqualified, worthless in regard to their faith. But they will not get very far, for their meaningless nonsense and ignorance will become obvious to everyone, as was that of Janus and Jambres. But now you have diligently followed my teaching, <laughs> conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, steadfastness, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but the Lord rescued me from them all. Indeed, all who delight in pursuing righteousness and are determined to live godly lives in Christ will be hunted and persecuted because of their faith. 
But evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue. Continue in the things that you've learned and of which you are convinced, holding tightly to the truths, knowing from who you learn them and how from childhood you've known the scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in, in Christ Jesus, surrendering your entire self to him, having absolute confidence in his wisdom, power, and goodness. All scripture is God-breathed, profitable for instruction, conviction, for correction, for training in righteousness, publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete, proficient, outfitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, he starts out warning us about this these days, and he ends saying, we need the word. We need the word. Amen. I'm telling you, the difference is being made. The line is being drawn. Those who will hear, will hear and obey. Those who will not, what little bit was in them will be taken away. And yes, there's a great apostasy. But let us not be of those who are falling away. But let us prepare ourselves to be the bride of Christ. There's a great work yet to be done until Jesus says the last one just came on board. Let's go. Hallelujah. Thank you. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Powerful word. Just, just one thing that the Lord dropped in my spirit when she was teaching about the bride. In Revelation, it says, they are that are with him mm -hmm. are called, they're chosen, and they're faithful. Yes. The book of Ruth gives a beautiful picture. The call went out. We king needs a bride. They all came in. All the beautiful women, the young girls. Ruth was chosen. Are you talking about Esther? Esther, I mean, excuse me. Esther. Esther yeah. was chosen. But she went through purification. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> purification for a long time yes. until she became the bride. That's what we're doing, and that's this message today. Yes. And we're going through purification. Right. Now, awesome message, I'm telling you. Yes. Ooh. Mm. What a word for the church. Amen. God's given you a great message. Great message. Amen. And so let us let it continue to purify us through the washing of the water by the word. And every time you get a hold of something that the Lord let you know this is purifying you, yeah. skip a little another spot. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Angel. Hallelujah. I didn't miss it this morning. I said, I'm going to get fed. Yeah, no, right. I tell you, God is good. Amen. But you know, Jesus said, if you love me, yeah. 